And so let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Felix Gill. He is a postdoc at the Digital Society Initiative at the University of Zurich. And um, he presents his research on investigating issues of trust in health systems, a topic that has gained a uh, massive momentum during the pandemic. And um, I'm very happy that he wrote a book about that topic. I don't know if you've read it, but it is, as uh, Frank Kumli said, a must read for all of us involved in healthcare and innovation. And I could not agree more. Uh, and with that, Felix, uh, the stage is yours. And um, yeah, enjoy. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Laura, also for organizing this and um, everyone to be here. I understand that's your lunch break, so I hope that will be entertaining, but also a bit relaxed. So um, feel free, obviously, to drink your coffees and also eat your lunch. I will start sharing my screen. All right, can you all see that? Perfect. All right. So, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and the invitation to talk to you uh, about my book, which was published uh, last month. And uh, the book is about what is public trust in the healthcare system and focuses on data use. Um, maybe just a brief introduction. So if we would meet in person, this is how I look. <laughs> and um, I have a background in European public health and health policy. I um, lived and studied in the Netherlands, Sweden, England, and Switzerland. and. Um, the majority of the book is really work, which was actually started in Sweden and then continued in England and now what I do here in Switzerland. And um, my current focus is on national electronic health record system, so public trust, user trust of those systems. And then I'm also um, leading our projects in the area of trustworthy data spaces, health data spaces, AI and medicine, and um, data sharing policy. And my work is funded by the Digital Society Initiative in the Canton of Zurich and other funders, um, including also third party funding from Novartis and Sanitas uh, Foundation. And um, I think what I try to do now here in this presentation, because it is also a book presentation, I would like also to take you along the journey uh, on the progression of my research of the last 10 years, because that is the time span this book covers. And so always when you see a picture um, in the presentation, um, I will talk a bit more about like motivations, what I have done, why I've done it. And then there are the slides which provide more of the content. And um, the presentation towards the end will focus on one specific area, which I think a lot of people are interested in. And that's about the measurability or let's say the possible methods we have to quantify or get evidence about trust. So let's start. Um, so my idea with this background in European public health was from the start to inform health policy making governance and um, to see how we can provide evidence and guidance towards those making policies and also actors um, from the local level, but also to the international level, so that they can provide um, a framework and a governance structure that potentially breeds trust. And the focus of my work since the beginning were different case studies around uh, data use in the healthcare system. And um, I started this work in Sweden, so that my, my master thesis was a pilot study on the measurability of, of trust in, in healthcare. And I was back then at the Karolinska Institute, and I, I think I got triggered by, um, by a lecture by uh, Joran Thompson, and uh, there was a lecture on global health and uh, there was also an uh, almost before Christmas or so almost the same time uh, as now in the year. And um, and I thought, you know, it's such an interesting topic of trust. And I, I just got hooked by it. And um, and then I thought, let's write a pilot study, a master thesis on the topic, because in Sweden, the, you have half a year for the master thesis. And, um, and, and back then, I think trust, we, we understood that there was an important topic, obviously, in healthcare, but not, you, you wouldn't see that term emerging in, in public debate as you see it right now and now also in policy documents. So back then I would say it was even more a niche topic than it is now. But um, uh, I started then the, the thesis with uh, Mess Fintesma, who was my supervisor back then. And, uh, and we, we tried to see what different ways um, we can find to measure trust. And then that brought me um, to England and um, which I will cover at a bit later stage of the presentation because what I would like to show you now 
10 years later is actually that while back then I think I I saw an interest in this field but I, it wasn't that everyone not everyone but but there were, you see so many published papers now and reports about trust and as you Laura said already since the COVID pandemic, I think that accelerated really the, the field a bit. Um, but we also saw development beforehand already. What you see here on the, on the bottom left is that we now see an increase in publications around different issues of trust in healthcare more broadly. But then also in our field or the field I'm focusing on data use or digitalization of healthcare, we see that actually there's a broad interest now. And here's just a handful of selection of reports, mostly from Switzerland, but also international reports, which... Um, so, or which highlight in different uh, forms um, the importance of trust for data use and the digitalization of the healthcare system more broadly. And um, we also see that there's now an industry, not uh, an, an interest, not just from the research community, but also from the industry, from politicians, um, and also from um, from charities and, and NPOs. And uh, now we are moving more into a field where at least what I would say coming from like now 10 years experience that suddenly <laughs> there's a huge um, an uprise of the of the topic area. And um, so I think eventually what we want to do, and that was the focus of the book, is really to answer what is then this public trust? Because when we use those terms, we want to be able to explain what they are and eventually also... Um, start to measure public trust etc cetera, etc cetera. so conceptual precision i think in the field is key while recognizing that obviously trust itself is a concept where we don't have a common definition um, we have books filled with uh, definitions of trust on different levels defining what trust is but i think what we need is really a, somehow an understanding of, of a good conceptualization if we later on want to build policies um, that can foster trust. So what I would like to start now is um, with you to go a bit through like understandings of what trust is that is also all covered in the book so you can also read that but um, I think when we want to talk about public trust in the healthcare system it is usually good to start with the easier concept which is trust and the beauty of the topic really is that you are all experts because you all grew up in, in a society, you all as a private person, not talking to you now as a professional, but as a private person, you have a good feeling of what trust means to you, what mistrust is, what um, betrayal of trust is. So initially, I think it's quite easy to, to approach the topic. And depending who you read and uh, what, what background um, you have, like disciplinary background, you might, for example, engage with Eric Erickson's uh, work on um, Kindheit und Gesellschaft and um, childhood development. And uh, according to him, you will see that um, the first one or two years of life are actually already the first years where people learn what trust is. So in the feeding and abandonment, so that's the argument, the infant learns um, about, about, or obviously cannot conceptualize it in that sense, but has the first feeling of what a trustworthy environment is. And then we also see then in the later years how our trust relationship broadens. So it's not just the nucleus of the family anymore, but it goes into the society. And then when we grow older, we learn um, um, maybe to trust also others. And uh, we also now even go into into definitions of um, trust that go beyond the, um, let's say, human context, but uh, we discuss trust in technology, trust in AI, et cetera, et cetera. That is also something interesting to consider, I would say. And uh, Ute Freyward from Berlin wrote an interesting book about that, um, that in the history of conceptualizations of trust, that was not always the case. You know, when you, when you go back a few centuries, the uh, initial understanding of whom or what you can trust would be along the lines of faith in God. So God was the only entity, let's say, you could trust. And then we see that definitions of conceptual of trust in encyclopedias change over years um, and centuries that, that broaden up where you can also conceptually trust then your your family, your village, et cetera, et cetera. And now we, we, uh, we, as I said before, we discuss issues of trust in AI and indeed have also their uh, conceptual um, yeah, disputes about the um, if it's actually useful to use, for example, the term trust in the context of AI, because some would argue that trust in itself is a very interhuman relationship. So 
what I tried here in this paper um, in 2020 is uh, to try to demonstrate my understanding of what trust is. Um, we see that across the um, uh, different theories that there are some commonalities which I think they cut through all the theories and descriptions of trust. And I tried to answer if somebody asked me, okay, what do you think what trust is? Tell me briefly, I would say, well, tell the truth and let me choose and I trust you. So it's a saying I try to bring together where I try to bring, to bring together the main components. So on the one hand, we know communication is key. Without communication, trust cannot be established. Communication is not only us talking to each other, that also includes, for example, signs and signals um, and and um, also like visual communication, obviously. And uh, then what we what the purposes of this communication is to convey truthful information. And then we already run into the first bigger problem, what is truth? And uh, we might have different understandings of what truthful is, but the important part is that the receiver of the information perceives this information as truthful. So we need truthful information. The next part is autonomy. So usually trust theories would describe that trust is established in situations of choices. So you trust A over B, B over C, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Nicholas Luhmann would probably argue if there's no choice, you might be left with hope, or you maybe have a wider confidence in the wider system. But in day-to-day -day trust relationships, there's usually the, the decision point um, of choosing who to trust, um, which is part of the concept. And at, at the next stage, obviously, when you want to choose something, you need um, the different alternatives to choose from. Okay, And um, as a last part, and that's something which is sometimes difficult, I think, especially maybe in the policymaking world, depending where you work, that trust cannot be guaranteed. So we have good evidence. We now have a lot of knowledge about what makes something trustworthy. And we can do a lot of things right, but there's no guarantee. So there always there's the risk that despite you as an actor or um, the healthcare system in general is doing a lot of things good and a lot of things right, still the users or the public might not trust. Um, then going a bit further, trust in itself is a relational construct. So you would conceptualize along the lines of A trust B to do or not to do something X. And um, it's illogical, I would argue, from the trust perspective, theory perspective, that you would trust somebody or something in the expectation of harm. So trust usually um, is established in anticipation of a positive outcome or at least no harm. And the general understanding why we are now interested in this field here is that if the public or people trust a technology or in healthcare intervention, like vaccination, et cetera, they are more inclined, more likely to use this technology. So that's usually how it goes. And as you see here on the right, this, this marble, um, that should show that trust is a future-oriented concept. So you always trust something to happen in the future. And if we would be able to foresee the future, you could theoretically argue that um, that you might not even need trust because trust is often um, understood as a mechanism, let's say, that could overcome future complexity, future uncertainty. And um, and so trust is an important part of our life, of our society. And uh, we see a lot of um, scholars arguing that trust is a fundamental part of, of um, the economy of our uh, life and uh, and makes us or makes it possible for us as social um, um, uh, humans to interact with each other. So then let's move on to, to London. So I wrote my, my master thesis in, in Stockholm, right? And then I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to start a PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. My supervisor were Professor Nicholas Mays, Health Policy, and um, Dr. Sarah Smith, Psychometrician. And uh, also when I started there, I had the idea, well, let's, let's start a measure, <laughs> let's get evidence. And, um, and that was actually surprisingly difficult because we saw very early on, well, with this understanding of, of, of concept or measurement development, you, you need uh, conceptual precision. Because if you don't have a good fundament of the understanding or concept, you cannot develop measurement instrument. So then we said, okay, let's maybe go a bit back and start really with the concepts. And so, I had the opportunity back then to work on three different case studies. One was um, um, together also with, with the uh, University of Oxford on working on um, 
on public perceptions of the 100,000 genomes project, so data donation and genomics research. Um, there was with the Health Experience Research Group there. Then I was looking into um, experience and perceptions towards biobank um, research, data donation. And the, the other case study was uh, related to the CARE data program. There was an initiative also the, uh, in, in the NHS, which tried to bring um, data together to trace the patient path, but the initiative never really started. It failed due to several concerns, including trustworthiness. And here, interestingly, the data, while the other two case studies were qualitative interviews, so interview qualitative, uh, the qualitative data I used for this uh, case study, a uh, news readership comment. So um, I, I was searching for articles in the big newspapers that discuss CADO data. And, uh, and then I downloaded all the readership comments and um, I analyzed them by hand back then and uh, was looking for um, discussions of trust, confidence, faith, and other synonyms, or not synonyms, but terms people use as synonyms of trust, and to see how the term is embedded. So for example, if people would say, well, um, I don't trust David Cameron because he's not transparent, okay? Then yeah, I would see, okay, transparency or more communication is linked to trust. And that's how I conceptualized um, 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 trust in, in this context. And as I said, the case studies were all data sharing, data use case studies. And um, so the PhD then was, I guess, and that's also one of the major parts of the book, where it's um, structured in several parts. So the first part was really, okay, why is that necessary? But that's something I covered, I think, already in the talk. The second part was where this public trust developed, and then it went to the conceptualization. So where does public trust develop? I would argue public trust develops in the public sphere from open public discourse about personal experience and experiences of others. So this understanding of the public sphere, I guess, goes back maybe to Jürgen Habermas and, and others, and, it's, um, and maybe back in the days, the understanding was the public sphere is like this social club where men meet. Um, whereas nowadays, obviously, the social sphere, sphere changes, and there's also criticism towards the concept in itself, if there's just one social sphere. But what I would argue is that around certain uh, topics, for example, um, CRISPR-Cas9 methods, etc., or vaccination, etc., we see that uh, people meet in different Aura. There can be, yes, the coffee place where we maybe meet after a lecture. There can be in a sports club, but obviously also online. And then those spheres in different communication channels form around certain topic and people interact with each other and discuss their opinion and thoughts in one way or the other. And that's also said is obviously a bit idealistic, but I think the difference here, what, what is important to recognize is that public trust in opposition to individual trust which is between me and you, for example, me, one person listening, um, is that public trust is something which is more like a, a community-built uh, construct where um, people really talk about their own experience, the experience of, of relatives of the past, etc. And that also means that obviously this concept doesn't fit to um, every um, um, intervention or activity in the healthcare system. So I would argue it's probably a bit illogical, for example, to talk about public trust in surgery. Um, you see some studies because surgery might be something more like for fitting for a concept of individual trust, usually in, in concepts where public trust or interventions where public trust is, in, is working well. I would see that in, um, in healthcare system activities which have a notion of altruism, of the benefit for others, um, where, for example, vaccination, you get vaccinated for your for your own benefit, but also the benefit of your family around you and the society. Same with data donation or, for example, electronic health record systems, which I will talk a bit about later. Um, they usually have multiple benefits and they go beyond the personal benefit. And that's where I see public trust as a useful concept. So what is public trust then? So here, I know it's not good practice to have so many words on the slide, nevertheless, that's a definition I would I would propose. Um, public trust grows in the public sphere and open public discourse, and as a result, it determines the actions of the healthcare system. We see now in other studies I do with my colleagues that the legitimacy part is sometimes difficult to understand. But the idea would be that um, because the public trusts healthcare system actors, the actors are legitimized to 
do whatever they are trusted for in the public interest. So that's the argument here. Public trust builds on information equally relating to past experience, present perception, and future expectations. That is really the core of the conceptualization. And that is also what I will unfold a bit in the next slides. And then we see that public trust is, is established in anticipation of a net benefit. So that goes a bit to what I said before, people trust or um, place trust in the actors because they anticipate not just a personal benefit, but also benefit for the healthcare system, benefit for society, etc. And then towards the end, well, the public participates in trusted healthcare system activities. So I, I tried to summarize in this definition all bits and pieces what I've seen in the recent years in my, in my research. And um, and what we what we see really why people care about public trust um, and why we as um, as healthcare system professionals, researchers, but also industry care about public trust and the politicians is because the two main effects really are legitimacy and participation. I would say those are the primary effects, and then afterwards comes a tail of further effects. So we see studies saying well. Public trust um, uh, increases social cohesion, uh, feeling of safety, and can increase levels of public health, um, of population health, and so on and so forth. Can also, um, depending on the context, decrease healthcare system cost. And um, and so th that is, I think, really why 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 a lot of people would like to have um, high levels or at least sufficient level of public trust. And then trust in itself and medicine as I said before in the very beginning, is one I would say of the central features of the patient-physician relationship. So the topic in itself of trust and medicine, trust and healthcare is by no means new. It's well researched. I would argue conceptually there's also not much research uh, necessary anymore because we have books filled with good, good evidence of what this patient-physician relationship can look like. Obviously now with new technologies coming in, the conceptualization changes and that also requires to go back to the books and back to the work and see how they how they should be adapted. Um, but but what we see, um, what, what, I, what I thought years ago is that with the concept of public trust, there was not such conceptual clarity and that's really how I started, right? Um, and now going into the, what, what is public trust? What do you see here is an overwhelmingly number of, of, of themes that uh, make public trust. So we see on the one hand causal themes. So they, you could argue are themes that um, make something trustworthy. Then we have the effect. And we have framing themes. And um, if you want to go in more detail, please read the book. It's open access. So, so then uh, I describe that in clear detail. But just looking at the three areas, um, um, I think it's important to understand that the concept I, I developed was um, meant to be um, as a basis for, for measurement, right? So that was one of the drivers. So I separated out. So what are the causes themes? So what makes tr trust? What is the effect, etc. So those two then can be translated into items, you know, depending on what kind of measurement instrument you will develop. But, but there was the idea that that's the groundwork. And uh, framing themes is something interesting, I would say, because they are often overlooked. So those themes, I would say, are not necessarily making or building public trust. They're not part of the inner core of the concept, but they have a huge impact. They can have a huge impact. And often when we see why certain trust building initiatives don't work i would say they might not actually you find the reason in the causal themes but you find the reason in the framing themes because they're overlooked um so for example one thing is um at the moment um, you have like public sentiment zeitgeist the public mood so the public mood is something where where you see okay people may, might shift more towards conservative views etc cetera, etc cetera. and that can have a huge impact on trust building huh? same with fears um, if there is a certain fear towards a technology founded or unfounded, it doesn't matter. But those fears are in kind of prohibiting, actually, that, that people can engage in trust relationships and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think those those framing themes are actually an interesting area to look on. And, um, and that in totality, I think, is the conceptual framework, which is the core part of the book. And that should explain why, what public trust in the healthcare system is. Um, the, the, the research paradigm and the I think the, the importance why the, the, the conceptual work is so central is because what I would argue is well let's say if we go down this conceptual list of causal themes here um, they they can translate into into two different things so if you know for example that security is important for for uh, trust building and data sharing which I would say is quite intuitive you can say well this could on the one hand, um, mean that we can develop um, governance and policy actions guidance. So we can say implement IT security measures. I used here an example from the Swiss um, Swiss Personal Health Network, 
Um, and then on the other hand, we can have an assessment form as a broader term, extending or going beyond uh, measurement. We could say, well, computer systems are um, housed in a physically secure environment. So you can really connect guidance and action across um, uh, horizontally to, to all of those themes. And I think that is important. The, 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 the fundament of the work should be the evidence coming from the data and not necessarily um, expert opinion alone. No? So where are we today? So what we have, I think, in the field of public trust research, we have good conceptual understanding of what that could be. We can develop guidance. But where we are stuck a bit is in the implementation phase and the assessment phase foremost. Um, assessment is something I will discuss at the end uh, of, of the talk, but um, we see now that we have an increasingly amount of, let's call it guidance, um, where different actors come together and try to develop, okay, what makes something trustworthy in the healthcare system. Um, we see those, let's say, codices, ethics guidelines, et cetera, emerging, but, but they are often very inconsistent, um, sometimes very loose conceptual underpinnings, sometimes very context specific, and obviously then the guidelines work there, but maybe not somewhere else. So, so it is a bit, I would say, messy um, in, in that area. And, but still you see the drive. So there's, there are a lot of people who really meaningfully try to, 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 to find ways and solutions how to um, establish uh, something um, as a trustworthy healthcare intervention. Um, and um, I think there's a bit at the moment the tension exactly between that. And then the other way, if you go more into the industry, they are also like, okay, but we need to be able to evaluate if we invest resources, we want to see is this cost beneficial, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the interesting work at the moment is somewhere between implementation and assessment. So here in Zurich, after um, my time in, in London, so I was uh, four years, I guess, at the London School of Hygiene. Then I was a um, short uh, time in the University of Cambridge. And um, afterwards, I had the opportunity to, to move to Switzerland um, with my family. And uh, we uh, we live actually here. You can see it on the right side of the picture, further in the back, in a town called Talbier. And I started at the ETH with um, Effie Bayena at the Health Ethics and Policy Lab, and um, that gave me the possibility to branch out in different streams of, of trust, public trust research around uh, around data data use in uh, in Switzerland, and uh, I could then further test and refine the concept and develop different ideas. And then two years ago, I received funding from the University of, of Zurich from the DSI, um, which allowed me now with colleagues, um, which are also here in the talk, uh, to uh, work together on different case studies. Um, uh, on one hand, we use, for example, the, the conceptual framework I showed you before, and we validated and translated into um, into basically the cultural settings in Switzerland and around Switzerland. So we uh, went to, um, to Switzerland, all neighboring countries and the Netherlands, and tried to, to, um, to develop with participants and focus groups how the concepts can be translated and applied to electronic health records. And then, um, and, and another work we do right now is on, um, on what the public understands as a trustworthy health data space, because that is something which should be implemented in Switzerland sooner or later. That is, I think, in parallel also to the European health data space. So, so that is roughly what I'm, what I'm doing right now. And uh, then we, we also do an interesting study on, um, the policy and uh, the role of, of trust and policy. And um, so you see that, that the work is now branching out in different areas, but it always comes back to the conceptual work um, presented earlier. To close the presentation, and um, I think to, towards the end of the book, I'm trying to explain or say, okay, what three areas of application are there? Um, one is in the area of communication. So we can derive communication guidelines from the conceptual framework. We can derive um, indications of how to quantify and get evidence. And that's what I will discuss now. And then the other part is, is the policy recommendations. So. Well, I thought because what also here in, in Barcelona, for example, where I'm right now at the, uh, the conference, a lot of people are always very interested about evidence and measurability, which is understandable. But obviously, not surprising. So what we see interestingly here is in the, in the field the, from a system level, what is the gold standard, right? So, so what did people do over the last 20 years or so? They measure. So they un unroll national household surveys or smaller surveys that can include psychometrically scaled instruments or not, but the idea is to measure. And here, 
we have four, I think my favorite four articles from the field and um, you see they are, um, are spread out over, over 20 years. And interestingly, when we just look at the articles, well, we see that there's almost no progress. You see, they, I would say, well, they question over 20 years, come always to the same problems. And, um, and for example, just the 2013 one, uh, half of the measures employed qualitative methods, 33% were pilot tested. And then the next one, 10 studies did not explicitly mention dimensions. Some did not define them and so on and so forth. And that strictly goes against good um, recommendations of like scale development and measurement. So you can really question, okay, how did those instruments come up? Nevertheless, they are, they produce evidence, which is used in, in, in different ways to inform actors, but also policymakers. And um, we see in the latest paper from 2023, for example, um, that, that the authors call for creativity. We need to understand why the essential role of trust and um, we need uh, continuous work in that field because we need to get, I think, a bit more creative than just the measurement in itself. Um, my, my main criticism in the field is uh, well, that a lot of the measures have loose conceptual underpinning. So honestly, I also, in my PhD, I did a psychometric analysis of four instruments. Sometimes you have no idea what, where the themes come from, you know? um that they, they it, it just they, they make sense okay yes but we, we don't know if that's actually measuring what it should measure then i would argue that one method only captures a fraction of trust building trust is a highly complex um, cons construct and um, embedded in a huge network of actors usually when we talk about trust in a healthcare intervention we have different actors involved and from a user or public perspective that also means that different actors could be trusted as for example face representatives of the system and uh, and then we have uh, that this we see that the survey quality often is questionable so the focus of my work at the moment goes in towards closing those gaps so really the idea is to see okay what different methods are there which can produce evidence which is meaningful to inform policy making obviously the evidence will be different different methods produce different evidence but I think the totality of those methods can actually be, be a helpful and interesting um, um, yeah, mix. So to close, um, there's the example of electronic health records. That's what I'm working on at the moment, um, partly. So we see that typical questions when we talk about the introduction of those national electronic health record systems are, okay, what are the resources needed to build public trust? Okay, good. So that goes into more economic questions. Then we see questions, how can we build a trustworthy national, trustworthy national electronic health record system? Yeah, good question. And then um, eventually, what is the level? So does the public trust the um, electronic health records? So my argument is here that we need a multidimensional trust assessment to inform policy and governance. And um, also those questions were, didn't change over years. They are um, almost always the same questions, just different context. Huh? So here I brought you a list. Um, it's not a, it's something I came up with. It's not a final list, there's more to it, but it should just show you a bit of different methods we, we have at hand. So the, the light blue ones is what you see what is done frequently, that's the standard. Okay, so we see the measurement scales are enrolled. We see that interviews are done, qualitative studies. We see that household surveys are conducted that could include psychometrically scaled instruments, but also just open questions, etc. And we can count the effects. So we could, for example, see, okay, well, there's an increase of acceptance of electronic health or opening of electronic health records. And that's why we might believe uh, trust increases. However, I would be cautious with that. Just because something is increasing doesn't mean necessarily that, it's, that the trigger is was trust. However, we see now that I think we can include more uh, different methods. And, and one is AI-supported open data research, so digital research methods where we can um, um, collect uh, huge amounts of, of openly available data and see, for example, how the public discusses certain topics or like a discourse analysis, social media discourse analysis. Then one of my favorite areas at the moment while, while I'm working on our trust performance indicators, here the idea is, so you might know like KPIs, key performance indicators, then we have quality indicators, we have performance indicators in the healthcare system. Um, we have, um, uh, so, so those exist and the idea would be, well, Maybe we can um, compile a set of indicators, evidence-based uh, indicators that are able to uh, continuously routinely collect data along a certain healthcare intervention. And um, and then we, we have those data to, to analyze and see uh, how 
the uh, the intervention is performing from a trust building perspective. And then from economic points, we can go into cost benefits analysis, also trust games more in a laboratory environment, etc. So I think the next steps in that field should go, and I'm not the only one saying that, is uh, are really to, to think creatively about wider and different um, methodologies so that we have the possibility to understand and um, dissect let's say, uh, the uh, trust um, or public trust uh, from different um, perspectives to inform the wider process um, of, of policy. So without conceptual precision and robust evidence attempts to build and maintain trust are the best um, a stroke of luck. Because if we really don't know what we talk about, it will be difficult. And um, what do we need? I think we need this multidimensional trust assessment um, in the future. We need appropriate trust building guidance um, that needs to be understandable foremost also and, and also useful um, to be applicable in the field, um, ranging really from primary care up to, to the governmental level. And eventually that should then lead, that's the hope, to a higher level of acceptance of digital health um, innovation more broadly in healthcare. So thank you very much everyone for listening. Um, that's the book. It's uh, the Open Access is funded by the um, SNF. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix, for this uh, very interesting talk and uh, for also not only explaining to us what your book is all about, but also your own personal story from your master thesis to this point. I think it's, it's very impressive. And um, yeah, does anybody of you have any questions? Um, feel free to ask them either directly to unmute yourself and just ask them or to write them in the chat and I'll make sure that your voice is heard. <clears throat> Alessia. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, really interesting presentation. I have a question about when you talk about public health intervention. Can you divide um, a measurement of trust and acceptance? Or what is then the difference between accepting an intervention and trusting the intervention? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the conceptual boundaries, that's something we, we discussed. So we had a colleague here, um, Stuart Palmer from, from Denmark, who wrote also a paper on the um, uh, reliability, trust, dependency differences, and um, exactly. So, so with acceptance as well, can you separate it? Uh, depends, I guess. Um, not always. I would say acceptance is not necessarily motivated by trust. So sometimes we have different reasons to use something. It's not always trust. So for example, we might download, or in the COVID times, we, we downloaded a tracing app because we wanted to meet with friends in a restaurant. So it was like a very different motivation than trust and maybe trust was secondary also i would say in a lot of interventions in healthcare maybe trust is not really always at the forefront because usually when everything goes fine nobody you know like nobody talks about trust usually trust comes up when there's high degrees of uncertainty there are scandals etc but um but i think the acceptance question is is is, is the right question and um trust i would then conceptualize it more that trust is one of the different factors that lead to acceptance but not the only one, yeah. Okay. Hans? Yeah, thank you, Felix, for your very impressive talk. I really like the way that you really also work on concepts, like in a very also philosophical way. I'm also from the Institute for Philosophy, but also working in public health. So very refreshing to see someone uh, working on things also like I might do. And my question is about the term of Thanks. trust. Yes. And um, reliability, do you also mm -hmm. use the term of reliability? For example, giving, I have a problem with trusting in technology. For my, for example, mm -hmm. um, when I drive to my office and do I trust um, on my bike that I will drive there, that I will uh, reach my office, or do I rely on the functionality of my bike and translated this to trust in technology? Do you... Um, how do you, yeah, deal with this term, or do you use it? Don't you use it at all in your work? This is something I'm interested in. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, Stuart Palmer, he could <laughs> answer you the question very well because he, he really wrote the chapter on the topic, reliability, trust, and dependence. Um, uh, I would argue, so on the one hand, I very strictly focus only on public trust to make it a bit easier in the life. Um, so I say, well, you know, that's the focus of the work. And I absolutely recognize, yes, reliability is there, dependency is there on the other side as well. Um, well, what we would argue is that reliability is um, something in situations where the risks of, let's say, not betrayal, but something of, of a bad outcome, let's say, don't really matter so much. So, so the, the idea would be like re reliability is like a low risk scenarios, whereas dependency are even beyond trust because you really depend on a positive outcome, you know, like in life or death, emergency situations, etc. You could also maybe argue that trust in itself is not the right concept anymore because the risk, the stakes are so high that the only outcome you can accept is a positive outcome. And that also goes then beyond trust. So that's something we discussed um, and, and I would absolutely agree often it is just like, yeah, it should just work. It's reliable. It's fine. Like trust is not always the, the concept and, and focus. Yeah. There was a follow-up question by okay. Stu talking about existence of vulnerability. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stu, maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah. So uh, I well I, I can't okay no so vulnerability usually that's I didn't talk about that that's right um, so you the understanding and in trust theory is that in the act of trusting you make yourself vulnerable towards the other because obviously you shift autonomy let's say or power even to the person you trust and um, so usually you trust in situations where you can't yourself solve the situation like you need to go into surgery or you need to get vaccinated well and 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 then you usually transfer autonomy towards the trusted other and in this situation you make yourself vulnerable towards um, obviously betrayal um, or active um, misconduct but then also something which we didn't talk about much but i've I would in the, in the framework, for example, human errors or unintentional negative outcomes can also happen. And and human errors can, for example, happen. So so that is something how I see the vulnerability coming in. But you're right, I, I didn't talk about it now. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Other questions? I would have one regarding the mm -hmm. indicators that you were talking about. This is a very yeah. Interesting topic because that's exactly what my PhD is about and trying to Perfect. identify <laughs> indicators that we can use to measure the digital public health system maturity on a national level. And I think trust is one of the core topics of that because you can have mm -hmm. the best intervention if the people do not trust the intervention, they will not use it. And so together with, with Manuel, who was also here on the meeting today, I'm conducting a, a narrative review to find those indicators. And we, what we found currently is that it looks like um, the majority of those indicators is collected and answered through surveys of, 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 of people. And I was wondering if you have encountered any other uh, more robust indicators and data samples that one could use to, even as a proxy for, for assessment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we are just starting with that. So that's a new project. And um, we should talk after the <laughs> presentation as well. Um, no, so, so the idea is you're right. So we see that, um, but I think uh, and that's something which is up to discussion. I don't know. So, so the feeling at the moment is that we actually also have a lot of indicators which are, but that also depends on the healthcare system, but which are, um, which are uh, routinely collecting data about I don't know data breaches, about um, accountability, about um, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, my my feeling would be that we probably can find indicators. It's probably a mix in the end, but and depending on the process stage of the digital health intervention, if it's more in the let's say development, implementation, and the, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I cannot really give you an answer right now, but it would be interesting to talk a bit further about the topic because um, yeah, I'm also now with with colleagues from Latin School of Economics and um, Vassar University. We are writing a, a discussion paper on that. Um, because when you talk to industry, obviously they say, well, you know, we have all the KPIs and, and, and the idea is not new. And also the idea of quality indicators and performance indicators is not new, right? So the, the hypothesis would be that we find um, a meaningful collection that said that will not be perfect, but maybe it can contribute in a meaningful way. Yeah. 
Thank okay, you. There were that. other questions. Um, yeah, there are two other questions. One is from Stu. Where is the context in your view of public trust with regards to the data? Okay, so the context is, uh, so the case studies, maybe uh, those like broader case studies where data is used for the system benefits or for the well, personal system and societal benefit that can be for research, can be for care or improvement of management um, or quality in the healthcare system. And um, yeah, so so I think that, that those are the case studies where an in vaccination is, is, is the classic, I would say from a historical perspective, the classic public trust field. So vaccine hesitancy, like Heidi Larson, the Villain School of Hygiene, for example, they do great work in that area. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's maybe the question, if I understand right, the context, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stuart, you're here. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Stuart, lovely to see you. Um, we have another so question. So tell us about the paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another question from XK. Um, besides mm -hmm. understanding what public trust means, do you find that public trust is mobilized in a specific ways in policy to do or to achieve yeah. some ends? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wrote another paper about the hype of trust with uh, Caroline Braille. She's not in Bern. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So also when I start a lecture, usually I start with this journey from my village to my parents, which live in the Münsterland. And um, and I, I usually take those pictures, you know, at the airport, commercials, you know, even like hand cream, uh, which is labeled with trust, <laughs> or uh, Lululemon sportswear, etc. So you see that trust obviously is also um, a fashionable term. It's a, it's a hyped concept. It's uh, used in marketing. Clearly, that is also something interestingly, maybe as a bit side connection to that question, when you um, recommend something on trust and you write your guidelines, right? Um, it's still like a good question. And then from an institute, from industry perspective or institutional perspective, when you look at your organizational chart of your, of your organization, who is the responsible? Is that something for the marketing department? Is that something from the communication department? Is that something from the law department? Or is that something from the IT department? And that's something which is highly not addressed in those guidelines as well. So depending, you can clearly imagine, depending who picks up the guidelines, they interpret them more into IT security or towards marketing. So, but overall, I would say we need to be very careful with the term. That's also good then the question's going to reliability, dependency, et cetera, because trust by no means is the uh, holy grail for everything, right? And it's it shouldn't be overused um, because I think it is already conceptually, I think, quite an overstrained concept because you can imagine it's one word, trust, and it should work and serve so many different relationships in so many different contexts in our life, uh, ranging from a private perspective, but also in technology and AI. So how can one concept, one word, solve everything or, or serve everything? So that's why I would be very cautious with the word. And um, I fully agree that the term is often, often used and mobilized in different ways. Huh? Okay, other questions? Not in the chat, but right. uh, Felix, uh, give us okay. a one minute pitch of why we should read your book if we haven't read it already. Okay, that's a good question. One minute. Ah, well, you don't know. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. No, I would say uh, read the book because I wrote it um, in an accessible way. The chapters are structured that you can read them on a commute. I always thought if the potential audience is somebody who maybe sits on the plane, flies somewhere, commutes to work. And uh, the idea is that it's uh, easy to read for a wide audience and it should give a good introduction to what trust and public trust is. And then I would hope um, that you as actors and professionals in the healthcare system see some connections and can translate that in your own work. So it should be really a guide for uh, or inspiration of, of what you can do uh, to be more trustworthy. Yeah. Thank you. I think that was a, was a great pitch. And if the download numbers will not increase by 24 now, I would be very disappointed. <laughs> um, okay. I posted you all the link to the book. And I also posted you the link to our YouTube channel, where we will upload the recording of this webinar next week. Um, for those of you who are in our networks, I will circulate them also through the newsletter. And I will make sure to figure out how to send them to those people of you who registered through Eventbrite so you can also get the link afterwards. With that, uh...